Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to Liam Halligan, a journalist at The Telegraph who spent a decade in Russia where he ran an, an investment fund. But he's back in London and right now on the Kaiser Report. Plus, Liam, here it is, BNE, Woo. Business New Europe. You're going to be the Economist magazine of the East. Is that right? Well, we, uh, this magazine started in 2006. It's just taken in a new investor. We've merged with IntelliNews. We got 40 odd correspondents. And you've got a column here called The Invisible Hand. I've got The Invisible Hand. And, and yeah. in, this, in this column, latest column, you say that the G20 is kerfunked. There's a new, new, new what, what, what? Tell, well, tell us. Well, I think, Max, there's a real contrast. In mid November, we had the APEC summit, Asia Pacific. The APEC, yes. Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. You've got uh, Russia in that, China, and the US. Uh, and a huge amount of business has been done at APEC, including a big gas deal, another one between Russia and China, uh, and many, many other bilateral deals with real hard cash. And then you had the G20 in Brisbane uh, just a few days after, and almost nothing happened beyond a vapid So everything's moving east. Completely uncosted. Russia's moving China. Everything's moving east. That's where the action is. That's what you're covering. Everyone's going there. Except NATO. <laughs> Except NATO. <laughs> NATO can't come. Well, They're B not allowed. B They're B being shut out. BNE covers <laughs> Eastern Europe and CIS and the Baltic states uh, and Central Asia. And this is a market of you know, hundreds of millions of people, a $2 trillion market cap in total that gets very little coverage in English. Uh, and yet it's a big emerging part of the world. All right, it's called um, BNE, that's, that's what Business we're to cover. New Europe. It's a new publication. I'm a subscriber www.bne.eu. Fantastic. Top now, side. the reason we have you on, Liam, is because you wrote this column at The Telegraph called Japanese QE Tsunami Risks Global Meltdown. Now, I've been reading your column for years now. It's really a great column. I always never miss it. But this one in particular, I, I think, was extraordinary because it gets at this point that over the past, really, since 1989, when Japan started their quantitative easing to try to revive the economy that crashed. Remember, 89 crash, stock market, the Nikkei was down from 40,000 to 8,000, the property bubble crashed, and they engaged in this quantitative easing, and they are the leader, the global leader. And we saw something remarkable because the Fed under Janet Yellen recently said, okay, QE3 is over January, uh, October 31st, but Japan just the next day said QE, I think it's 12, <laughs> picks right up. QEN. <laughs> so isn't there, isn't there a global QE? Isn't Japan at the epicenter of it. Yeah, the, the idea that uh, QE ended in the States and nothing happened, meaning that the QE unwind isn't dangerous, that's of course an absurd idea because the QE baton was straight away passed to Japan. And anyway, in the background, every daily uh, we have hints from the ECB that they will st soon start doing over QE. We've had kind of corporate bond QE uh, under the counter, if you like, from the ECB for many years. They've doubled their balance sheet in the last five years. And we could, could, could soon go to sovereign QE uh, in the Eurozone. And everyone knows, of course, uh, in the run up to the US election, particularly now Obama's lost the midterm congressionals, if there's the slightest hint of real trouble on Wall Street, then the, the, the virtual printing presses will start up again uh, in Washington. So QE, basically, the government is buying back its own debt. You know, they issue a debt, and then they buy it back, essentially. Effectively, so, yeah. So on, they, they do it indirectly, so it's not absolute over monetization. Right. Well, the difference between QE and monetization is that QE... There's is an, an accounting trick. There's an, a tacit idea that someday they're going to unwind it. They're, well, that's one of the one of the. If they don't unwind it, then it's just outright monetization. Then it's outright monetization. Which it is, in, in effect. Would you say, Liam Halligan, mm. that anyone who says this isn't outright monetization is smoking crack? I don't I, know if you I, use I, those I, terms, I, Liam. I, I, I doubt many central global central bankers are actually smoking real crack. But I'd certainly say, and I think most economically literate people without a big stake in benefiting from, from QE would agree there is quite serious obfuscation happening uh, and this is an unprecedented monetary right. Who experiment. Who benefits? The people who are selling the bonds to feed this QE monster. So the Wall Street banks, the City of London banks, they're the ones who are benefiting from all this because they get the fees from building up this enormous QE. But you have some statistics here, some numbers that are really incredible. And governments benefit, of course, Max, because uh, by by basically the state buying their own bonds via their central banks, albeit with a little accounting shimmy. Well, they keep shimmy. interest rates low. 
they keep interest rates low, but it generally means that governments don't have to address the massive fiscal issues that stalk the Western world. They don't have to make tough decisions on spending. They can just keep borrowing. Here in the UK, we've had a triple digit sterling budget deficit now for six years in a row. There's a good chance, even though we've got much stronger growth in the UK this year, that the budget deficit will actually be even higher than it was last year. By rigging the, the sovereign bond markets of the Western world allows Western governments to not level with their electorates and to take the fiscally easy route. But QE, the only growth they have in the UK is debt, because the debt under Osborne is up by almost a trillion pounds. And the deficit, as you point out, is not going down. And this year, year over year, it's going up. So what, why do they do all this austerity? Because that's nonsense. There, isn't, there hasn't been any austerity. The only austerity are, are, has been imposed have been a wealth transference from savers to speculators. That's the only austerity. There's not actually no debt re repudiation. There's no debt paying down debt. The austerity is a hoax. Well, you're right in the sense that uh, government spending for many of the past months, uh, government debt, sorry, for many of the past months, uh, the extra borrowing they've taken on has been bigger than the increase in GDP. Uh, and also household debt is pretty much where it was uh, at the time of the subprime <coughs> collapse. Having said that, there are parts of the UK, and you have many readers and uh, viewers in the north of England, of course, that are quite dependent on uh, state spending. And there have been some state programs which have been cut back quite severely. So for some households in the UK and certainly across the Eurozone, there has been real austerity. But the overall envelope of government spending, there hasn't been austerity. We've had real terms increases overall. And that's at a time, and this is what really worries me, Max, when interest rates have been very, very low. So debt service costs in the UK, where we're sitting now, they're, rough, they're slightly more than the UK spends each year year uh, on defence. Uh, but if interest rates go up just a couple of hundred basis points, which they easily could, we'll be spending more on debt service, not paying back the debt, just rolling it over again and again than we do on education, right, the, on the, state the, education in this country. The, the UK, and that's when I think morally the electorate will crack and say this is completely uh, egregious, that we're spending more on debt service. And a lot of our creditors here in the UK are now foreign creditors. So our debts are increasingly dragging down our balance of payments on the net property income come from a broad side, once we're paying more to service our debts, a lot of that debt held abroad than we are to educate our children in the state sector, then I think politics will have to change. Yeah, UK pays a billion pounds a week in debt service. Yeah, something like that, yeah. That's right. About, so yeah, that's 50, 52 50, billion yeah, pounds a, a, a At very year. low rates of interest. At low rates. So what happens... And the reason they're low mm -hmm. is because of quantitative easing. Because we're rigging, easing. The, rigging because the bond it's, market. it's accounting Abs fraud. Absolutely. All right, so... Um, but, Let's, but Japan, you see, the point of this, which you touched on in your Telegraph article. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about my article. No, this, Stop about, asking me questions. <laughs> no, but I mean, this is, the, the UK is part of the circle of fraud, but the, 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 the center of the fraud is Japan. They're the, because their debt to GDP is- 240%. 240%, the yeah. UK is- it's well, there are many definitions. Officially, it's about 90. 90. Maastricht terms, it's about 100. Unofficially, if you include public sector pension liabilities, it's more like 150. If you then include financial interventions, sorry, it's complicated. And private then, debt, then it gets up to well, 600. Even, even government without the private, if you include financial but interventions. But apples to apples comparison, the way Japan yeah. counts it, yeah. they have 240%. Compared to our the about, way to the UK, about 90. They, yeah. they say it's yeah. 90. Yeah. The US, yeah. I think, is getting close to 100, et cetera. Yeah. But this 240% is, is a debt in indebtedness level. Level that you see, you saw countries engage in during World War II. Sure. When they were fighting World War II, it's actually yeah. getting higher yeah. than yeah. that. So, for example, uh, Abe, the guy who runs Japan, some guy named Abe, Abenomics, Abe, Abe. Shinzo Abe. Shinzo Abe, right? And I'm American, so we don't, we don't care about the these Abe. things. Some guy <laughs> named Abe. The Bank of Japan has expanded its balance sheet from 40% to 150% of GDP over the past 18 months. And, and it's saying, heading for 70. It's heading for 70%. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, the, the QE, again, you, the government's buying bonds and they're just sticking it on their own balance sheet yeah. and they're ex completely exposed interest rate risk yeah. in terms of rising yeah. interest rates. Yeah. So, for example, the Federal Reserve Bank in America, which is the American Federal Reserve Bank, they're already leveraged at 50 to 1. Yeah. So these guys are, must be leveraged at, well, the, 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 the straight up and down debt on their, as a percentage of GDP is uh, getting around 70 percent. But... Some people have equated this to almost a, a, a suicide mission, like a kamikaze banker, that they're tr they're trying to blow themselves up in the same way that you know Pearl Harbor or you know they they have a culture in Japan 
of, of uh, a ceremonial sepulchre of, of suicide. I mean, these bankers, they don't seem to be acting rational at all. It seems like they're doing ceremonial suicide. It, okay, okay, the thing about Japan... To you, to you, Lee. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, 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 I've, I've got the ball and I'm about to throw it back at you, Max, between your eyes. The thing about Japan is that a lot of their sovereign debt is held uh, with their domestic um, uh, citizens. It's, it's, on, it's, it's not held overseas. Huge savings, uh, domestic so, so, savings. So, so just like after the Second World War in your country and in mine, there was tremendous patriotism about buying uh, sovereign debt. War bonds and all the rest of it in Japan is, is JGBs. So Japan doesn't have that foreign creditor exposure and the related currency risk uh, with its massive uh, but government But they've chewed through debt. that. They've chewed through that. Yeah. What they have done, though, what they have done is, uh, and it's... It, They've massively increased their monetary base, but they've seen no requisite increase in, in broader money. It's very, very important, as many of your very informed viewers will know, that the, we distinguish between the monetary base, which is he heading for 77 GDP in Japan, and what you'd call broadly the money supply, which is the extent to which that monetary base is then lent out by the banks to firms and, and households and, and the broader economy. And what we've got in the UK and we've, what we've got in the US, less so, but what we've got in Japan, absolutely, is a massive expansion of the monetary base, trying more and more and more and more to get the banks to lend, and the banks just saying, no, we're not going to lend, because actually we're getting quite fat off this QE, and we'll just park it on the central bank's balance sheet. Right, so, and, and therefore, and does QE, we're solvent, does QE we're cause solvent. deflation, or does it fight deflation? Okay, this is, this is one of the, the, the cardinal economic questions of our time. I would say, because QE allows the zombie banks to carry on. It provides them with cover. It provides them with protection. It allows the politicians not to address the real issue of shaking up the banking sector and reforming it. QE actually causes deflation because it allows... Ha! Us, it allows ha! Us, Danny Blanchflower! Ha! It allows us to carry on in this moribund way. But, 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 once the inflationary toothpaste is out the tube, once the QE has been done, it can then, at some point when confidence returns, be lent out by the banks and rapidly turn into inflation. Right, and so what we've fear. been saying on the show... Not hyperinflation. I'm not saying hyperinflation, by the way, which is 25% a month. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we could have, once this QE money enters the circulation, the velocity, if you like, to use an economic term, the velocity of circulation goes from its current historic low, then you will start to get some inflation in the system. We could easily have in this country high single digit, maybe even double digit inflation in years to come. Once this QE money starts to, if you like, find its feet. Okay, we got about 30 seconds left. I want to, what is the risk of contagion? Because Jap my point about them, Jap Japan being almost suicidal in this approach to their monetary policy, uh, we, and the fact that they picked this up the policy, QE ball. This, What's the risk this, of contagion? This policy is so extreme. In 2008, Japan's uh, monetary base percentage of GDP was was 20 percent, as as it's shown in the graph on on, on my Telegraph column. We we've got we're up at 50 percent now, having gone from 40 percent in just the last 18 months. And it's Abe's stated aim, holding on to power, to say 70 percent. Right. But so as, they're like as, the Fukushima as, of as, central as banks. As Keynes said, it's freaking. They should rename it uh, Fukushima uh, Central Bank because uh, that's what this fellow over there in Abe and I, We got to go anyway. On that <laughs> encouraging note, Liam, thanks for being on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report. Be Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Liam Halligan from The Telegraph and this new... BNE. Relaunched, relaunched. Boy, this, this is... Oh, it's so hot, I scorched myself. <laughs> if you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.